Thank you so much. Good morning. A wonderful day, Lord's Day. And it's always fascinating when we combine uh, the Lord's Day with a day such as Father's Day or in the prior month, Mother's Day, and try to think how, such as in the case of Father's Day, we deal with uppercase and lowercase matters simultaneously in the way in which all these things relate together. So I'd love for you this morning to take your Bibles now and join me, whether it be with your device or else hard copy, as you make your way in the Older Testament, pausing in our series in the book of Acts, uh, making our way to Deuteronomy chapter 6, which deals with the significance of the way in which a father relates to his, his family. Now, let's get our bearings here. This passage of scripture that you're looking at with me this morning, it has to do with a series of farewell addresses that Moses is delivering to the people of Israel. The older generation has now, by and large, passed away. He's looking at a new generation. He himself will not be the one to be able to usher these people into the land of Canaan. That'll be Joshua's responsibility. They are, right now, is he is positioned in a setting where, lovingly, it's been described as the Upper Desert Discourse. And here with this new generation now, what Moses is about to do is to be able to equip the family units to be able to move forward. And he has got a multi-generational vision in mind. And so what I want to do with you this morning as we explore this passage of Scripture together is this. I'm not talking to dads this morning. Otherwise, I'm talking to less than 50% of the people. I'd be talking to children. They're saying, this doesn't relate to me. I'm not a dad. Talking to women, they're saying the same. No, I'm talking about our dads. Your dad, my dad. That means now we're talking about all of us, you see. And uh, furthermore, by doing this, I want us to be able to ponder how do we honor our fathers. Because isn't it fascinating that in just the prior chapter, uh, Moses delivered the Ten Commandments and, among others, spoke of honor your father and your mother. And so now with this honor established, what he will now do is to teach the fathers in particular how to guide the family in an honorable way, you see. I also want you to bear in mind that they are about to enter into a pluralistic culture, the land of Canaan, a land of many false gods. And they're to bring this singular sovereign God, Yahweh, with them into that land and be able to function effectively. How do you function effectively by bringing the singular into the plural? That's what we've got to do here in the States as well. In a pluralistic culture, how do you bring the singular aspect of the I am the way, the truth, the life? No one comes to the what? Father, but through me, uttered Jesus. How do you bring that into a pluralistic culture and a pluralistic cultural mindset? We're going to be exploring that this morning. I'd love to read to you from verse 1 down through verse 9. Here you find these words. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son, And your son's son, do you see the multi-generational approach? This is vision work. By keeping all the statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be long, hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord 
God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now we reach the point where we enter into what is known in Judaism as the Jewish Shema. It's prayed morning and evening. It goes as follows. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets be between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So we're going to be looking at these verses and more in the coming moments. I'm going to move this mic because, as the old song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. <laughs> it just kind of came to my mind now. Let's look to our Lord in prayer, okay? Father, we love you. We love you so greatly, so deeply. As the Father, you sent the Son into this world to die for our sins. Prayerfully, we come to the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. Now, pastorally, we recognize that there is a spectrum of experiences in relationship to our fathers. We embrace, Father, the totality, totality, totality of life, and we realize that at the same time we are dealing with fallen humanity when we talk about earthly fathers, but they are to be representatives in their fallen state of the sinless one, our Heavenly Father. And no matter if they are with us or no longer with us, we need to honor them, find ways to reflect upon what it is that we saw, what it is we can learn, how to transfer all of this into the way in which we function effectively in 2021 and beyond. These moments are important. So we're praying now once again that you would warm these hearts, engage these minds, shape these wills, We've come here again now to see Jesus and to only. I'm going to pray these things still again now in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Late in the evening of the past few days, I, after a meeting, I did what comes natural to me, turned on a ball game. And the commentator uh, is talking about how much pressure it is for the parent to watch a, a young man on the pitcher's mound throw balls as well as strikes. And I was thinking about that because of an experience that I had years ago where my youngest was on the mound, Benjamin. He would be playing at that point for the Diamonds and then make his way to the point where he would eventually be playing collegiate ball as a pitcher. And I was standing off to the side watching the coach, you see, Burke. Burke had been highly recognized nationally for his skills, collegiate level as a pitcher. He was on his way to professional baseball when, when an injury struck the elbow and those in baseball they know the idea of Tommy John surgery. And so his career and his dreams and his plans were derailed. But I want to tell you, he was and is an outstanding coach, now a physical therapist, specializing in particular with, with young athletes. He's watching the, the, the movements of my son on the mound. I decided to go stand next to him and talk for a few moments. 
we're talking about the physicality of the pitcher and how you need to generate power from the legs and not simply rely on the shoulder or the elbow. Otherwise, you're going to blow out your arm. I chime in, have they, is enough time given to talk about and instruct young pitchers regarding the nature of a mound? Each pitcher's mound is different. If you pitch the next day after it rained the prior night, your spikes are not going to hold in the dirt the way they might otherwise. And then what about that dry mound in an August day? We talk about such. All of a sudden, I notice there are men on first and second base. Not good. Beck turns to me and says, what do you think? I said, you're the baseball coach. And he smiles and looks at me and says, but you're the life coach. It was a profound moment. I went back home and simply jotted that little experience down. It's been over a decade since that happened. Just now utilizing it this morning. What we find is that we are living in a culture now where people increasingly are hiring life coaches. What's a life coach? A life coach is a type of wellness professional who helps people make progress in their lives in order to attain greater fulfillment. Life coaches aid their clients in improving their relationships, their careers, and day-to-day lives, so says an expert in life coaching. But if you were to ask me, how do you spell life coach? I'd spell it D-A-D. What I'd love to do with you for the next few moments is to explore this idea of the father as the life coach. Bearing in mind that we're dealing here with Moses who has seen the better days of his life and is now passing the baton on to the next generations, plural. And there's Joshua just off to the side, most likely, his right-hand man, who will be taking over Moses' work. For you see, when God buries the workman, he does not bury the work. And though we buried my father three years ago, at the same time, you have to live life. And the family goes on living life, you see. So what I want to do with you this morning now is to draw three I believe significant insights that are found here in these verses that simply relate to the way in which all of this pertains to 2021 living. And the first flows out of verse 1 through 3, and I'm going to phrase it like this, that as our life coaches, we honor our fathers for, number one, the biblical truths that have been taught And you say, I haven't necessarily been taught a lot of biblical truths. Maybe you grew in a home where maybe they didn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Or maybe a father came to the Lord at a later stage of life. Or maybe you're just not certain of his eternal uh, setting. Nonetheless, taking the ideal here now and allowing it to permeate within within this sin-ridden society of ours. Notice how all this begins to work itself out. No. Now, that's a very contemporary word. No. This is the commandment, the statutes, the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. It's not coming from Moses, he's saying. It's coming from the Lord your God. I was commanded to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. This was the promised land. It's a land that's filled with spiritual chaos. It's untamed. They're going to be venturing in, these people, with a supposed loyalty to Yahweh, God. 
But at the same time, this is very multicultural. They have many gods, and now a collision course is about to take place. The question is, are the family units prepared? The same question has to be asked today. Are we prepping? Are we preparing? We can't assume America is a singular culture. Supposedly, out of the many, come one. But at the same time, there is a tearing at the fabric, and, and believers have to understand that. So, the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to promise, possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God. Camp on that for just a second, would you? The fear of the Lord is a rich concept throughout your Old Testament percolates through the first five books of the Older Testament. It carries with the idea of your response to God's word that results in faith in the Lord, love for the Lord, and loyalty to the Lord. Faith in the Lord, love for the Lord, loyalty to the Lord. Furthermore, it is the operating principle, the first principle of life. For in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And in the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs, you see, that is served as a bookend experience for understanding how this response to God's word uh, brings about such faith in the Lord, love for the Lord. Loyalty to the Lord. It is an operating principle. It is the first principle of life. And so we don't get ahead of first principles, do we? And so now, keeping first things first, this is how Moses wants to use as a starting point for moving forward into that land. That you may fear the Lord your God. But furthermore, and you're still in verse 2 with me, Notice that this is a multi-generational visionary. You and your son and your son's son. How does this relate to today? Let's say a father is speaking to a particular child. It doesn't matter if the child is five or 35 Never assume that this conversation is meant for a singular generation. Never assume that what is being communicated at this particular point in time is meant for that and that time alone. View this as an avenue for future generations. What will this child recall when the child grows up into manhood or womanhood? This is not a reservoir of truth. This is a channel for truth. And so always assume that the message of today is to be translated into a ministry for tomorrow where they take perhaps a memorable experience and now they've got to figure out how do I take the truth that was, that was gripped in within that experience now and transfer it into my own personal future. Reservoirs, no. Channels, yes. You and your son and your son's son, collectively daughters. By keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Sticking with this whole idea, if you forgive me for all the sports imagery. Um, special moment. September 14th, 1990. Never happened before. I saw the game. Late in his career, Ken Griffey Jr., Sr., who had been a key member of the World Series champion Cincinnati Reds years before, was signed to play for the Seattle Mariners. 
what made the thing so beautiful was that his son, Ken Griffey Jr., was just starting his major league career. In the first inning of a game against the Angels, Griffey Sr. hit a home run to left center field. Now the rest of the story. His son followed him to the plate and hit another home run to almost exactly the same spot. Never before. Only time a father and son had hit back-to-back home runs in the history of baseball. Ken Griffey Jr. said later that his father greeted him at home plate. Saying, that's how you do it, son. Welcome home. Israelites are about to enter into the homeland, the promised land. Tensions that would await them at that time, tensions are there in 2021. They've got to bring the singular into the plural. And the earthly father has got to understand the principles of what, how the heavenly father wants to operate with this in mind. Welcome home, son. That's how you do it. Israel, this is how you do it. Get up to verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of, did you see this? Your fathers. Now what he's doing at this point is introducing the rich heritage of faith and how a heritage of faith should produce a heritage of faithfulness. As the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, what he now does is that he takes us from the past and then builds off the past and creates a bridge into the future. In other words, there's a retrospective looking back. There will now be an introspective looking within to be followed by a prospective looking ahead. Those that read the classics know the story of how Virgil wrote, the, wrote that Aeneas found at Rome after the fall of Troy. And he said that Aeneas fled burning Troy with his father on his back, leading his young son by his hand. In other words, he was doing multi-generational. Visionaries do that sort of thing. And if you have the weight of responsibility as a single mom this morning, do it. If you have the weight of responsibility as a single dad this morning, do it. And we love you both for it. For as our life coaches, we honor our fathers for, number one, the biblical truths that have been taught. I want you to build a bridge between the retrospective, the introspective, the prospective, past, present, future, the past, hindsight, the future, foresight. Put it together and what do you get? Insight. Insight. And you're building a bridge from the text of God's word into the heart of that next generation or generations, you see. As our life coaches, we honor our fathers for, then first of all, the biblical truths that have been taught. And if you're having trouble pondering what truths might in fact have ever been taught, look at the way in which God worked in, 
around through for all the various angles, draw insights, pass them on. You're on to the second insight. Because now from verse 4 down to verse 9, as our life coaches, we honor our fathers not only for the biblical truths that have been taught, but now secondly, the relational flexibility that has been demonstrated. We've got to draw this out, don't we? So you're up to, uh, you're up to the Shema. This is so loved by the Jewish community, isn't it? And here it all begins with your verse 4. Because in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the centerpiece of the daily morning and evening prayer services for the Jewish people. It's considered by some to be the most essential prayer in all of Judaism. It's an affirmation of God's singularity and his kingship. And its daily recitation is regarded by traditionally observant Jews as a biblical commandment. And in the first verse of the Shema, the sixth chapter you see of Deuteronomy, this is among the most famous, the best known of all aspects of the Jewish liturgy. And it's recited that the climactic moments, the final prayer, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and traditionally as the last words before death. And when recited, it's recited with the hand placed over the eyes. And if you looked it up on the internet, go on YouTube and watch how the Shema is, is uh, presented, you will see all those facets on full display. There's a reverence there, which is to be attached with your God. But notice here, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now Moses is out on, in the plains of Moab, it's the upper desert discourse it's been lovingly described as. He's equipping the next generations. But for them to be able to handle the pluralism, the pluralistic culture of the land of Canaan, they're going to need to be able to counter it with the singularity of the sovereign God. So here, O Israel, listen carefully. The Lord our God the Lord is one. So there's the three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You shall love the Lord your God. And whenever this has been discussed in Islamic circles, when you're sharing the gospel, with, say, with somebody who's from an Islamic background, this is a foreign concept, to love Allah in their estimations. You fear Allah. But what he has now done for you and me is to be able to say, we can pull together the idea of the fear of the Lord with a love for the Lord. This, is, this seems like a, a conflict of interest to those outside of Christian circles. You see. But for the Christian, we get it. And we understand it, that God the Father would send the Son into the world to die for our sins. God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so you bring the singular into the pluralistic culture. And now what I want you to see here is that you shall love the Lord your God. Circle all the alls. Would you do that? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Never let people say that the Older Testament dealt with externals, and it's not until you get to the Newer Testament you deal with internals, because what we see here is that this is very consistent with the way in which the internal shapes the externals of life. 
God, when dealing with Saul, would say, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. We know who that's going to be. Because later when Samuel came looking for a king in the setting of Bethlehem, he thought he had come across 